What's up guys, Andrew Bain here, and on today's video we are going to be talking about five mistakes that every band or musician has probably made and how to avoid them or do things alternatively to make your career much better. This video ended up being pretty long, but I really couldn't cut out too much information because honestly I think it's all very useful, so if you stick around for the full half an hour, I truly think you guys are going to learn something. Before we get started, I just want to give a huge thank you to the two guests in this video, Jeff Menig and Ryan Tuck O'Leary. This is what they have to say before we start. Hey, I'm Jeff Menig. I'm the co-founder CEO of FeaturedX.com, the marketing director for The Masquerade in Atlanta, Georgia, and co-manager of multiple of bands. Hello, everyone. I am Ryan Tuck O'Leary. I am co-founder and lead A&R of FeaturedX.com. I play bass and sing sometimes in the metalcore band Fit for the Fit for the Kings. Now I can't even not say it, Jeff. I ruined it for myself. <laughs> Fit for a King. I say it so much That's on my podcast. It's so now. stupid. It's funny. <laughs> I play bass and sing sometimes in <laughs> Fit for a King. Um, I also sing in a band called Offered Mini Band, which is more of like an emo throwback band. And I have a podcast called Get Tucked. So the first mistake that we talked about was not having a plan before you launch your music. I've seen so many bands that go out there and release like a 12 song album out of the blue when they don't even have any audience in the first place. And I guess that they think that maybe just because their music is good, it will magically succeed. But unfortunately, that's not the case. You have to have a quite expansive marketing plan and you got to know how you're going to get your music out there and what content you're going to back up that music with. So we talked about this with Tuck and Jeff and here's what they had to say. I launched Left to Suffer from scratch so I can speak to this pretty directly. Um, <clears throat> if you're starting a mu musical project from scratch before you announce it <clears throat> before you make your social media pages you need to build up <clears throat> as much content as you can like if you can get six months worth of shit lined up um so that once you do start you'll never get to a point where you're running out of things and you're always one or two steps ahead at all times. So, you know, whenever we dropped a song, we had two more songs finished already. One of them, which the content as far as videos and marketing stuff was already in the works. So that when, when the buzz of the first, drop and the first song is dissipating then we can start the rollout of the next thing and that's where that trampoline analogy comes into play um and just continuing that cycle rinse and repeat over and over and over again until you build up enough literal kinetic energy where then you get that massive springboard such as dropping the load song and then that can really, you know, take you, you know, you just want to walk up step, steps, basically. So that's kind of one of the biggest things that I always see young bands doing wrong, where they'll, they'll drop a song or play a cool show and they'll celebrate it on the week for the, for an internet. But then they're like, okay, now what? And it's like, you should have already been working on the next couple of things. You should have like, we're always like a, thinking a year ahead and having the next year planned out. Three months go by, again, plan out the next year. You know, pivoting some things along the way, depending on what happened in that three month time, but always having a, at least a year long vision. So knowing exactly where we're headed, because if you don't know where you're headed, you're just fucking lost. As an, another example, we've been working on the Left to Supper EP that just started its rollout with the latest single about a month ago. And we have been working on it for what, eight months now, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, about. And um, another good example for current people, I think, to view in a sense of that of launching a project is the band Static Dress from the UK, where once I heard one song, all of a sudden, then another single is released, and then there's a music video to it. And not only is it 
um, done well, but everything ties in together where the content, like with Left to Suffer, everything has a motif to it. Everything has um, a common look to it and everything has a quality to it. And that doesn't mean that you have to spend a crap ton of money. Um, you just have to make sure that you have a really clear idea of what you're going for when you launch. Um, and to go off of your your boy before Andrew of why you shouldn't do a 12 song release and this is something I've talked to other people about too where they were like yeah we wrote all these songs we're going to get them all mixed and mastered and blah blah and I was like yeah but you don't even have the project out by the time you're three months deep and you put out three singles you might hate eight of those songs right. like you need to chill and you know by the time you put out music because for instance you you have a style to your band but people may gravitate towards one specific thing where you put it out and they find that they really like your singing or they really like your screaming they like your heavier moments they like certain stuff and your band's going to change and it's going to grow and it's going to absorb that information and that high that you get from when people give you positive affirmation and then you're going to fuel that into your band the next mistake that i see a lot of bands making is thinking that by changing their sound they are quote unquote selling out and that changing your sound is inherently a negative thing. I wanted to talk to Tuck and Jeff about this because I've seen lots of bands change their style to great success. An obvious example would be Bring Me The Horizon, but there's also other bands that have stuck with the same style throughout the years and also found success, such as August Burns Red or The Black Dahlia Murder, which basically still make the same album to this day, and it clearly works. It's not a bad thing as as long as that's what you want to do and that's who you are. If you're a band that wants to stay in the same lane and that's what you love and that's what you want to be, then that's perfect for you. If you're yeah. a band that when you release music and you get older and you discover new things, you want to experiment, then I just think everyone needs to stop worrying about what the outside world is thinking and just what do you actually want <clears throat> want to do like what's going to make you happy what's going to help you reach your goals to go off of that um you know to start on the one side is you know from the artist is when you make a change to your sound and you're doing it just for yourself and you already have an established fan base, that can be a positive or negative thing for you where people will either love it or people will hate it and you have to do it just because you want to do it, right? Um, so that's what's most important first and foremost, but there's things to be lost and gained on both sides and you can definitely find bands that have done it and you, you know, can uh, see how it's affected them. Now, with a band like mine, for instance, when I don't know if anyone's ever tried to write 100 of the same song, but it's pretty difficult. And usually by the time that you've grown, for instance, you know, we've been a band for over a decade. I've been in Fit Breaking for seven years. And since we're music listeners, you know, so one, as music comes out, you get influenced by stuff. And two, when you play consistently live, you can see what people really like and don't like. And now we have the internet so we can see what people really like and don't like. And the reality is we very much listen to our fans in a sense of, you know what? All right, maybe we could have gone a little heavier on the path. I agree with you. We could have. You're right. And you know what? That's constructive criticism. Thank you, fans out there in the universe. That's a positive way of letting people influence you. Do they, you know, are we going to not make uh, more like heavy metal influenced songs just because some people didn't like them. Absolutely not. We're going to continue to do that. Why? Because it's sick as fuck and we're more popular than ever. So you have to take a bit of both and balance it. Um, but I think that it's important for all bands to absorb and grow over time because, you know, some sometimes it works where if you just write record after record that's very similar, um, people will just continue to love you and you'll grow a little bit each time and it can stay very consistent. Being willing to try new things is important. And as an artist, it, it sometimes it hurts and sometimes it's very helpful, but overall it's important for growth because if you never try anything outside the box, you never know where your career can go. People shouldn't be scared of it, but don't be stupid about it. Like if you start changing your music, 
and all your fans are like, wow, this is awful. And really, it's not that good. Like, you were a super heavy band and you're just not meant to be Linkin Park, then stop doing that. But, like, if you can be, like, the word alive where you do make a change and then your online fan base has grown drastically and you've gotten, you know, really great streaming numbers and radio <laughs> success, that also can um, be beneficial for you. So, like, it, it goes both ways, man. For, for every one fan that's like, oh, creation destruction. You peaked at creation destruction. We have like 10 new fans that are like, I've never listened to that album, yeah, but of Dark Skies fucks. Yeah. You know, so you can't, you, you know, you can't win them all, but mm -hmm. you can, you know, digest and absorb what you choose. If you choose to stay in the exact same lane for a long period of time don't ever expect to then be able to change like august burns red could not come out with a record that's like bring me the horizon right you know what i mean like yeah they've Great been example. doing the same thing for 15 years so they've been doing it for that long for so long that they cannot change for and sure. don't just try and rip off Architects Doomsday Riff. Be yourself. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Yeah, that's probably the <laughs> wisest thing Finn McKenty said this year. And <laughs> so the moral of the story is basically do not be afraid of being accused of being a sellout by a select few fans. Listen to the majority. Let it shape your sound to some extent, but also make sure to follow your artistic integrity. It's definitely kind of a balancing act between the business and artistic side of things, which can be quite hard to manage at times, but hopefully this helps make your decisions moving forward. The third mistake that we talked about was not being careful about what contracts you were choosing to sign. Within the music industry, there are tons of different contracts for various aspects of the industry, whether that be like an endorsement deal with a guitar company or a record label deal or signing up with a manager who forces you to pay a monthly fee forever, even though he has no motivation to actually work for you or, you know, anything like that. So again, here's what Tuck and Jeff think about this mistake. So when it comes to contracts and stuff, I mean, the analogy, signing a record label is like, okay, imagine if you take out a mortgage for your house and then after you pay back the bank, you still only own 16% of your house. That sucks. Um, so that's generally what you're getting yourself into if you want to think about it in layman's terms when you sign a record contract, anywhere from 16 to 20% for a beginner contract, right? And sometimes there's some great benefits out of that because do you have all the money up front to pay for really cool stuff like go make a great record which is going to cost you you know nothing crazy 12 grand 15 grand and then you want some money for music videos right so that's another like ten thousand dollars and then you need money to market that so we're going to spend another five or ten grand on that and by the time we're say you know 30 40 deep and that's why you because who knows if your band will ever make any money Right? right. So that's the risk they're taking. It's the old Rise Records example of I'm going to take 15 bands that all kind of sound similar. I'm going to sign them. I'm going to throw them at a wall and like, oops, Sleeping With Sirens stuck. OK, Sleeping With Sirens made me so much money that it doesn't matter that everyone else failed. And that's generally the outlook that a lot of labels were able to base themselves off of because of their percentages being so in their favor where you also have as a band the liability of essentially anytime you break up you're claiming bankruptcy so if you own a bunch of money to a label and your band's not taking you just be like all right fuck it we're done um and you're out of it so that's also the perk and why you do that right um but i do find at least from my example where you know i signed a very similar beginner contract with solid state as the band did that label has been tremendously good to us they have cared for us like family. They've helped us financially. They've done things for us that a lot of labels don't do for people. And then when our contract was up and it came time to do a new contract, it was surely much more in our favor. So the other thing you can do is build your stock. Make sure that you are a great band and you get through that and you go out on tour. You didn't sign a 360 deal, so you still make a shit ton of money on merch. You really build your brand. And you know by the time your contract is up, presumably you only signed like a three, three record deal. Now you can go and really get something that's in your favor or you have a band that's pretty popular and you can stay independent. You'll probably make back a bunch of that money just with one or two independent records. Um, if you're signing a guitar or an endorsement or something like that, that locks you in to multiple years with a company and you're paying for stuff, 
the other thing that you can always remember to do is um yeah just stop stop buying stuff and stop taking pictures with it stop using it and if they actually came after you like that would be miraculous but if you actually think that one of those companies has the time to come sue you because you started playing another guitar it's not gonna happen so my advice to you is do whatever the (laughs) fuck you want um but you shouldn't really sign a lot of great companies don't ask for contracts some great some companies i've worked with are just no i trust you you trust me we handshake which i love Mm -hmm. all about and then sometimes you got to sign a contract but at the end of the day like i said you can kind of really base things off how you want to some extent uh obviously there's liability with that um but i wouldn't advise anyone say you're working with a company they offer you a very small percentage and you're stuck beyond a year don't sign that say okay i'll do it for a year i'll play your guitars for a year i'll I'll pay i wanted to buy this guitar anyway so any percentage is helpful right and then you get a little percent off, you buy that guitar, you play it for a year, you're happy. And then that next year, maybe you want to play something else and you go somewhere else. And because of that year of promotion, you find yourself doing better. Maybe that one guitar company will come back and be like, you know what? No, actually, you deserve 50% off now or whatever. Yeah, don't lock yourself into multiple years unless you really know what you're getting yourself into or you're getting like a bunch of cool free shit. Um Because that is the perk of building like an individual brand. And you're a great example of that, where you can play multiple brands. You can have multiple brands assist you and people will be excited about it just based off of your candor and how you uh, promote gear. Um, The, you can make a lot of this stuff your way. You just have to be willing to speak up. A lot of people that sign by bad contracts is because they signed their first contract. If you get offered a record label deal by a small label, well, maybe that's because you're catching some buzz. You're starting to do well. Don't sign that deal. Hold out. Wait till something better comes your way, because I bet you it will if you just keep doing what you're doing. Don't like let the outside sources fuck with what you're doing. If you got an idea and you're focused, stay focused and go get. My biggest things with bands and contracts is they think that when the ink dries, there's some magical fairy dust that changes everything about their lives. And I think they need to go into those situations realizing that that's not what it is and that there's still a shit ton of work that needs to go into it. Because <clears throat> I think a lot, of, a lot of kids and bands are impatient and they just want shit now so they're willing to just sign the first thing because they just think that if they sign it then shit's just going to start happening and yeah then six months later they realize that's not the case and then they're in actually a much worse position than they were in so to take tuck's advice to heart and be patient and go slower um and be willing to play the longer game so so that when you do sign that it's the right it's the right thing for you so in summary be careful what you sign and don't sign something for the flex trust me i like flexing as much as everyone else but it is not worth it if you're locking yourself into a year or more than a year of something that you're not actually going to be happy with the next mistake that we talked about was touring when you're not ready to tour I'm sure that a lot of you guys have been in bands that hit the road kind of expecting your band to blow up because you're going on a big tour across Canada or the US or something like that. But in reality, oftentimes what ends up happening is you realize how little money you actually make on the road and it honestly usually makes or breaks bands. Usually after tours, someone ends up getting kicked out or someone ends up quitting. Sometimes the band even disbands. So if you're not ready to go on tour and you don't actually have a demand for yourself, it might not be worth your time. Yeah, and some people just want to do it for fun just so they have the experience and say they went out, which I get it. But um, yeah, it's just a big waste of money and a big waste of time. If you're playing to no one, then it's really a waste of your time for sure. And you can take that money, those hundreds of dollars that you spent on gas and all that stuff, and you could put that really positively into marketing your band or creating content it's more important to focus on playing less shows, playing better shows. So, you know, creating a positive relationship with your local promoter so that way you can hopefully get on some better shows. Like say you're in a band and you want to sound like Fit for the Kings, then 
weekend, you know, go talk to your promoter and like try to get on the next show that's in the area because you're you're probably going to gain more fans doing that than um, going out and, you know, just po- doing a random tour that no one comes to. Um, but at playing locally too, like don't oversaturate, but make sure you promote it really well and get, get it to be worthwhile. But yeah, the whole like I'm going to buy a, you know, a van and we're going to go out on tour and, you know, play, you know, just as met, many shows as we can just doesn't really work anymore. It used to. Um, and it was definitely part of the culture before we had the Internet. But now it's much more advantageous for you to build up a following and then get quality touring opportunities. Um, fantastic Canadian example spirit box our scene just has a major supply and demand issue where people and bands just don't understand it whatsoever so it's just like there's not really a huge point in touring for the sake of touring unless you have the demand that calls for it because unless you have the demand that calls for it and then you can springboard that into more momentum and growing the band, it's only going to be a detriment to you. Your morale will be down because you're playing to nobody. You're going to lose a shit ton of money, thousands of dollars, if you're playing to nobody. You know what I mean? So major supply and demand issue, and then the whole instant gratification and everyone just wanting to do it right now instead of putting in the work and waiting two years and then doing it when it's the appropriate time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, you know, I don't give advice like that, like say not to do that because I just think it's stupid. I'm telling people not to do it because I've done it. You know, there's a lot of times that people are giving advice because of experience where we're not trying to like, you know, crush your vibes or nothing. Just we'd rather see you do something well than to just like rush into it and not have a good experience because it's much better, you know, when you do get to, you know, sure you have to play for free, but you get to open a, you know, a cool package for six days or something. And, you know, that kind of little stuff will be far more rewarding in the long run. Okay, so for that last one, I know it might be kind of a touchy subject since I know bands love to tour and I personally have only been on one tour, so I'm not really one to talk. That tour that I did was one of the most fun times of my entire life, but it certainly was not helpful to my band or my bank account, but it was a lot of fun and it has memories that I'll cherish forever. So in some way I would do it again because it was such a great experience. However, with that being said, that's why I really wanted to talk to Tuck and Jeff about it because they've been on more than one tour. And I can imagine that if you do plenty of tours like that in a row that all cost you money and don't actually grow your band, it would get old really, really quickly. Speaking of touchy issues, the next one might also rub you the wrong way, but mistake number five is thinking that your band only needs to have amazing music. Yes, amazing music is obviously a huge part of your band, but unfortunately in today's day and age, it's not enough to just rely on good music. You need amazing, branding, marketing, and a creative content strategy in addition to all of that because again, as we mentioned in mistake number one, your music is unfortunately only part of the entire situation. A large part of being a band is your brand and your your merchandise is a large portion of your income. Um, by selling CDs, selling vinyl, all this kind of stuff is really important, um, particularly in the vinyl aspect these days. So You know, using, again, my band as an example, Fit for a King, one of the greatest things that ever happened to us was getting Ryan Clark from Demon Hunter to make us a logo. And that logo ended up being that little F guy. And if I could tell you the amount of people that have that tattooed on themselves, it'd be crazy. And we've kept that ethos with moving on where also you can create a lot of merch where it could just be a hoodie with that little F on it embroidered. People are going to be stoked on it. You could do that in five colors. People are going to be stoked on it. You can do a million things with it. And if you learn that people like something, stick to it, like our American metalcore brand, like that's our thing. Like when we're really into it and we go for it it's not like when i'm on stage and i'm playing it looks like i'm not in an american metalcore band i i'm up there like a fucking meatball that's ready to set off fireworks and shit like a hot dog in mouth ready to party for freedom 
and it's <laughs> awesome and i fucking love it and i love the vibe that it creates and because we're just this like trying to be this positive fun uh, uh, metal experience and you know i think that we all really stick to that as not just we're not just doing it for the sake of it you got to really live it and we do really live it you know what i mean and it's it's a lot of fun and i love it it's important for all bands to focus on that aspect and sometimes it's more simple than others like does weezer need to really focus on merch and branding as much no because theirs was so simple where it was like all right we're all going to stand in front of a color background all right this time we like stand in front of a different color it's crazy um and sometimes you get lucky like that but a lot of times you won't get that lucky where you need little things where an example of growth in that was then death grip doing the different logo which i even have tattooed on myself me and bobby got it done because we also wanted a bunch of other people to do this we're like yo if we do it wow people do it so then we did it and then the next record is similar to that but a little bit different and grows and you take your emblem and you, you take your brand and you continue to embrace what you did but just tweak it a little bit Definitely. you know it's like doing merch you know it's like you know branding with a merchandise company and just gradually letting it grow and doing things new season um but jeff is he crushes this department the the simple fact of the matter is human beings don't remember things unless their brain computes it like seven or eight times or more so brand is everything whether it's you as a human being and what you want people to think about you, whether it's uh, Nike and a shoe company or whether it's a band, you have to think of it as the same thing. And you have to, if you want people to remember something, you have to hit them repeatedly over the head with it. Having a logo or icon or something that is just recognizable visually with then hopefully your own unique sound audibly creates more senses for the end person to connect with you and it just creates so many psychological entry points for them to actually become a fan of of the band because it really it takes Again, it, it's the ooh, piece of candy type thing where it has to be repeated over and over and over and over again until the end person is a fan. <laughs> it doesn't just happen overnight, like not usually. So I don't know. <clears throat> to me, brand is the, mo- is the most important thing. But as someone and- with, a, with a marketing yeah. background, I, I mean, I guess that's typical, but so there you have it. That was five mistakes that every band slash musician or even really any creative person can learn from and hopefully avoid in your career. I know that I personally have made many of these mistakes as we were talking about in this video and clearly Tuck and Jeff have made those mistakes along the way. So again, our point with this is not to make you feel bad about yourself. It's simply to try and teach you alternative ways to hopefully avoid making the same mistakes as us. So that's gonna be all for this video. I wanna give a big thank you to Jeff and Tuck for joining me in this video. They also have some parting words. Check out the new Left to Suffer EP on death out everywhere April 23rd. Listen to Left to Suffer, listen to Exquisite Dolaire, listen to The Gloom in the Corner, listen to Fit for the Kings, listen to Off-Road Minivan. Um, Check out FeaturedX.com. Go make a song with your favorite artist because you can, because they want to make a song with you and you get to own it for the rest of your life. So don't be silly. Go do that. And um, yeah, just take stock in yourself. Be an individual. It's a beautiful thing. Lean into who you are. So you can check out everything that Jeff and Tuck mentioned down in the description below or in the pinned comment. I also wanna give a big thank you to all my Patreon members whose names are on the screen at this point in time. There is a full other video that I shot, uh, which is gonna be exclusive to my Patreon because I know normally I offer music related perks to Patreon, but this one doesn't really have that. 
So I thought instead of doing that, I would give off more tips and tricks from my Patreon viewers. So if you're a Patreon member, go check that out. There's gonna be, I think it's another 20 minutes of additional content, which should be available at the time of this video. So again, thank you to everyone who's watching. Go check out those links to all of the things that Jeff and Tuck mentioned. Thank you guys so much for watching. I really hope that you learned something in this video. I know that it's not a type of content that I usually make, but I like doing things like this. I like talking to people who inspire me and more than anything else, I like trying to help you guys out. So that's all from me. Again, I look forward to reading all of your guys' comments. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time.